Hey guys, welcome to Twin City Church Online. I'm Pastor Jordan. And I'm Pastor Taylor. This is our little girl, Evie. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope that this message inspires faith, that it encourages you that God is alive and that He is relevant in your life. If you want to join us here in the building at Jeroboamra Community Centre, we meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Um, but other than that, tune into this word. I hope it inspires you, like Pastor Taylor said, and we hope to see you soon. Great to be here with you this morning. Uh, thanks for bringing on the great weather. It uh, was a little cool this morning, but sunshiny day. Fantastic to be here with you. Um, to you guys, what's it feel like? You've, you've taken over you, you, early into this experience. Pastoring a church is a, it's a whole different experience for those of you who have not done it before. And um, it carries weight and responsibility that you didn't realize until you've taken it on. And are they doing a good job? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And they will need your prayers. They will need your encouragement. They will make mistakes. Um, there's no doubt about that. We all continue to make mistakes. Uh, but when we're together, as we stay together, it makes a significant difference. And God's plan is for the church to progress. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's Pentecost Sunday. I don't know if you realize that. Yeah. Did you realize that? Pentecost Sunday. So we celebrate the um, pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I want to read to you from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, a passage you all know well, and I'm not preaching from this, but I do want to mention it again. It says, but you will receive, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I stand here today as a testimony of my mother and father's looks. <laughs> You're probably thinking, what happened to them? Oh. <laughs> now, it, it, it makes sense. And whether you like it or not, you, you're the same. You actually, without saying a word testify of the look of your mum and dad. Now, my dad's actually got more hair than me, so, and I didn't get this from my mum, but someone told me you get it from your mother's father. I, I don't know how it all works, but whatever, what, whatever it was, I didn't get it because there's not much left. But, but the reality is this, I testify of their looks without saying anything. Why? Because they're my parents. You, you, you know, when someone sees me and they know my parents, they think, Oh, yeah, he looks like his dad, he looks like his mum, he's got his mum's sense of humour or whatever else. They, they, there's a testimony that exudes from me simply because of who my parents are. Now, when we read this passage of scripture, too often we get caught up on this word witness as if it's something verbal we need to say. Can I suggest to you that each of you ought to be continually through your actions, testifying of who God is. Yeah, it's the, the, the reason the Holy Spirit came to you and is now in you is so that you are able to testify of the good work of God through your life. Our problem is this. Too many people take the word and they think witness means something they say. And usually what they say is different to how they live. And that's not a good witness. We're better to show what we believe and who our Father is by the way we conduct ourselves. And there will be a need for words from time to time. Our testimony should be the, uh, should be the story of our relationship with a God who loves us, who's forgiven us, who's changing us. We're not say changed changing us he's yeah. still changing us but he's not finished the work in us and and i know that all of us are appreciative of that in other people but we also need to appreciate that in ourselves we are still changing and becoming more like him and so pentecost for me means many different things but the point i wanted to make this morning is we are in the process of change and, and, and there's an ongoing witness that others have of us and our transformation that testifies of who God is, and what he's done. Uh, I, I know from a, a communication with Jordan that you're, uh, you're in the middle or not, you're nearing the end of a foundation series. Is that right? Yeah. How many people have got their foundations right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a few, 
<laughs> people don't, I'm like you, don't worry, I probably wouldn't have put my hand up either because there's one part of you thinks, yeah, I'm trying to work it out, there's another part that I don't, I don't want to say I got it all perfectly right because he might, he might make a fool of me. But, but the reality is foundations are critical to a building, aren't they? Uh, we know, and most of you I'm sure have seen TV shows where uh, you, you know about real estate and they show you a, a building that's got a problem and the problem it, it may look to be aesthetic in the sense that there's a big crack in the wall, but the problem isn't the crack in the wall, the problem is what caused the crack in the wall and what caused the, pro the crack in the wall is in the foundation. The tricky part is this, fixing the foundation is nowhere near as simple as fixing the crack in the wall. Because you can fix the crack in the wall, but if it comes from the foundation, the crack will come back. And you know, too often in our lives, we try and fix the crack in the wall without addressing the foundational issue. And, and, and you know, some of you are spending time and effort, discipline, and you're trying to fix cracks on the wall in your life when what really needs to be addressed is the foundational things, some of which I'm sure you guys have already covered. And foundational things make a significant difference. So many people, and I'm the same as you, do, do you know, I want to work on what looks good. I don't want to work on something that's unseen. Do, do you know, when you're fixing up a house, Painting is a good thing. I hate painting. But it's a good thing because you can see a difference. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're doing something in the ceiling that no one can see, it might be putting insulation in the roof or something like that. Yeah. It's such a, a long, difficult, dirty job. But you can't see any difference. Now, if you're freezing in your house, it makes a big difference. But the reality is when you paint a wall, you can walk in and you wow, the wall looks so different. And I love doing the things that make a quick difference, but the reality is real change is normally foundational, especially in our lives. Now, Jesus talked a bit about building, didn't he? And I think his most famous quotes about building are from the passage we're going to read this morning. As the house is built on the rock, the house is built on the, what is it? Sand? Is that it? Sand? Sand. <laughs> Everyone's super confident this morning. <laughs> there's a house that's built on the rock. I've already told you the answer this one. Behind, and there's a house that's built on the... Sand. Oh, sand, yeah. <laughs> now, very good, very good. Ah. <laughs> I want to read to you um, from that passage or the passage in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46 to 49. It says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do... What I say. Uh, we'll keep reading in a minute, but think of that. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built the house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, the Holy Spirit, and we, we, we spoke about that a few moments ago, the, the Holy Spirit is actually attempting to build into you. He, he's trying to create, uh, create an understanding for you of His purpose and His plan. He's, he's in the process of transforming your life. That's His goal. That's His desire. That's his, the outcome that He is tasked with, if I can put it that way. He's looking to build your testimony. He's looking to build your story so that through your ongoing learning and your experiences, as you become more like Christ, the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in you will produce a witness for Christ that will go out into all the regions. That's the Holy Spirit's task. That's his responsibility. That's his plan. Now, Jesus here... He's saying some interesting things, but the point was not the house built on the rock. The point was not the house built on the sand, because he says 
It's you, you're like the house built on the rock or you're like the house built on the sand. So the point was not the rock and the point was not the sand. The point was what he was saying before he said those things. He simply used them as illustrations to reiterate the point. But the first part of this is Lord. You know, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I, I, I wish that somehow when God created us, he removed the ability of choice that we had to say something that we didn't really mean. I mean, it would help in arguments, wouldn't it? I don't know about you, have you been guilty of saying something you didn't mean in an argument in an attempt to win a point? Yeah. I have. It's sort of like you bring in the levers to get the outcome you're after and then you pay for those levers later. <laughs> well, I didn't really mean that. I just wanted to win the argument, you know. <laughs> Jesus is saying, why do you say Lord, Lord? In other words... Why are you making out as if I am in charge of your life? Why are you making out that you have given yourself in submission to me? Why are you pretending in front of everybody else that I actually have some sway over your decisions and your behaviour when you don't do what I say? You know, when we say the word Lord, do we actually mean what we're saying? I don't know that we understand the depths of what we mean when we use the word Lord, but Jesus here is making a point to everyone in the crowd. Why do you say Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? In other words, what you're saying is not true. Because if it was true, you would do what I say to do. I don't know about you each time I consider this, and because I say Jesus is my Lord, I say he's my saviour. And there's no issue with him being my saviour. Uh, because we know that's the result of the finished work of Christ. He is my saviour. Clear. That's, that's crystal clear. There's no problem there. But when I say he's my Lord, that's got to do with my response to him. It's a little bit different. Making him my saviour is a decision I make. Uh, but, but it doesn't take a lot on my part to hand it all over. It's like a, it's an easy deal. It's, a, it's like, yeah, you can take all my rubbish and I get a brand new start. No problem with that. <laughs> but when you say his Lord, it changes the game. It's, it, 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 it's a whole different scenario. It, it's like you're letting go of your uh, decision-making ability and you're submitting it to somebody beyond you. You're actually saying, I, I, I am now giving you power over my life. So when I'm in an argument, I'll conduct myself as you say rather than as I feel. I mean, that's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. I mean, because the natural response of someone who slaps you on the cheek is to turn around and slap them back, isn't it? That's what comes natural to most of us, or depending on the size of the person, run. I mean, I wouldn't turn the other cheek. I'd be running usually, depending on their size or if I had any weapons or whatever else. Now, I, I, I'm very calculated. You know, the Christian thing I think is to run if they're going to hurt you. Jesus said, turn the other cheek, which is not running. And so this first passage of Scripture is extremely challenging. Do you think of other things in your life where you make a declaration? You know, I've got a wife, her name is Ruth. Now, she became my wife one day many, many, many years ago when we stood and made a declaration to one another, but that was, she became my wife legally. Whether she is my wife biblically depends on how I treat her. Uh, Jesus said something about what Paul said, rather love your neighbour as yourself. A little later, Paul didn't say it, Jesus said that, but a little later on, Paul said, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. <clears throat> so if she is my wife, 
Am I doing what Jesus said here? It, it, you, you know, if I'm not loving her in that manner, is she actually my wife in my thinking? There's some, some challenging things here to think about. Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say. Let's have a look at what Jesus said following that. He says in verse 47, As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. There's three simple phrases here. And the first is this, everyone who comes to me. Now, all around us are people who are interested in all sorts of things. The other day, I went to a caravan and camping show. Why did I go to the caravan and camping show? To convince myself of how foolish some people are when they spend all that money on a caravan and how, <laughs> despite the temptation, I'm not going to do that. That's what I was trying to do to myself. Not really. There was this part interest, part, and, 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 um, and, 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 you know, I like looking, but I hate spending. Now, it's all good not spending any money despite the high pressure sales pitch we got and how luxurious the caravan looked. And when it comes down to caravans and me, it's about money. And that is, you know, it costs three times as much fuel to tow a caravan. It ca it, it, I calculated how much you can stay at per night in a place and still just the depreciation would be covered by it. Why, why did I go there? There was an interest. Jesus is saying here, Everyone, who, if you've got a caravan, please don't be offended. <laughs> um, my, our family, my dad has always had caravans. He's got a motorhome, a bus at the moment. And so, yeah, no judgment here from me, just working it out for myself, you know. <laughs> Jesus said, everyone who comes to me. What, why? Why would anyone bother coming to Jesus? There's an interest to start. There's an inquiry. There's a question. There's perhaps an admission that this Jesus has something to communicate. It might start as a curiosity. But there is a possibility of a relationship that be goes beyond simple inquiry. He says, everyone who comes to me. And then the second point he makes is this, and hears my words. Now, when someone comes to Christ in some form or another, and I'm not talking about making a decision, and here's the words of Christ, the question is, what are they going to do? Now, the sad thing is this. And going back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we know that the Holy Spirit has come and given us power to be witnesses. The people that a searching for Christ usually search out someone who's already a Christian and they hear what they're doing through the way that they live their lives. Now, in Jesus' day and time, uh, for a very, very short period, let's remember, it's only three years of his life, was there an opportunity for people to come to Christ, hear his words, and to respond. Three years. I know he lived till he was age 33, but his ministry didn't start till he was 30. And there was a short period of time with a small group of people that were able to access him. He wasn't live streaming at the time. He, he didn't have a, any social media of any sort. The only way you could actually hear what Jesus was saying was to hear him firsthand. They didn't even record his messages. No tape ministry, nothing. And what Jesus relied upon, which we go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 80 is, he relied upon the fact that there would be people within earshot who would not only come to him, but respond to him, hear his words, and that they would then communicate those words to somebody else. It's how we got the New Testament. It's how we got the Gospels. Uh, they're just a simple relay of the a uh, perception somebody had about what Jesus did and what he said. And when I say a perception, I, I'm, a, I'm not in any way denigrating it, but, you, you know, Jordan and I can sit and hear somebody else speak, and he'll have one version, I'll have another version. It doesn't mean that I'm right and he's wrong or vice versa. It's just we both hear different things, relate a different way, and it actually at times speaks to a different audience because of our age, our hearing, our understanding, our uh, the thing that's highlighted to us. So the Gospels... 
um, express the words and the actions of Jesus in different ways, and it, it appeals to us all at different times in different ways. Good thing. But Jesus has spoken to us through somebody. You've heard his words. And what you've done is you've taken those words, usually only part of them, and and you've allowed them to have an impact on your life. And I say only part of them respectfully because we're all going through a process of sanctification. What I mean by that is that I'm still not in a place where I'm in absolute obedience to Christ in every area of my life. I'm, I still read the Bible and the Holy Spirit still highlights areas in my life that I need to respond to Christ's words in. So I'm not making a judgment there as much as I'm saying it's part of the process. It's part of the journey that we're all on. But Jesus here is saying, you know, so there are people who come to him and hear my words. And then he makes a a, a differentiation because people can come and hear. But then he says and puts them into practice. Do you you know everyone here is hearing some of Jesus' words? If you're here in this room, you're hearing some of Jesus' words through me. Maybe through what I'm saying, maybe through what I'm reading, maybe through the way I'm conducting myself. But that doesn't differentiate you from everyone else because everyone's hearing the same thing. You'll have a different perspective on what I say and that's okay. You'll pick up something and respond to it differently and that's okay as well. But the real crux of the matter lies in this last phrase and puts them into practice. You can sit in a Bible college for four years. You can have a doctrine of ministry But unless you practice what's being taught, it makes no difference. I'm a member of a gym. Makes no difference unless I go. Which I don't go very often. You you can read the Bible all you like. It makes no difference unless you put it into practice. And Jesus is making a point here, saying there's no difference between someone who comes and hears the word, because everyone can come and everyone can hear the word. Everyone can get the testimony or the witness of somebody else. Everyone can do that. And there's no difference between them. What makes the difference is the one who puts it into practice and the one who doesn't. And the sad thing is this, the one who puts it into practice ends up building like a builder who finds the right foundation Or, if you don't put it into practice, you may as well continue to build on the sand. And when you build on the sand, it can look good. Everyone's seen seen photos of houses that have been built, and sadly, you know, something's been wrong with the soil, or something's been wrong with the foundation. And a house can look great when it's first built. Uh, A a little bit of movement, and the whole thing crumbles. And, you know, along the the coast of New South Wales, uh, probably a couple of years back, was it? Some of the houses are on the edge of the cliff, and they're... They're built on sand. The rocks don't move. I don't know if they realise that. Rocks don't move normally. But sand does. And, you know, the erosion of the cliff has caused the houses to be in a precarious position. And it's so, so sad. Sad because they're losing money. Many of them perhaps not covered by insurance. But how much sadder is it when someone's life is built on sand? I'm going to lighten it up a little bit here, and um, I don't know if this applies to one particular demographic more than others. But how many people remember the game Monopoly? Yeah. Does anyone don't doesn't know what Monopoly is? I have. Did you? Was that? Oh, that was close. <laughs> the great thing is, if you don't know what Monopoly is, Jordan will ask you to play Monopoly. That way, he'll win. <laughs> I I don't know, most of us probably grew up playing Monopoly in some form or another and cheating in some form or another. Is that right? I don't know about, I I don't know why, but you want to win. You want to land on someone's hotel and get away with it without them noticing it. You you, want to rip them off somehow because the goal is to get the most, isn't it? Now the process, for those of you who don't remember, it's, it's not that complex. You go round the board, round and round, you want to stay out of jail, and you want to collect your $200, and you want to buy as much property as you can, and then eventually what do you start building? 
Houses, is that right? Yeah. How many houses does it take to build a hotel? Four houses builds a hotel. And some of you are wondering where we go, and this has got nothing to do with what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, um, my hope is that you'll learn something from this, and you might go away saying we talked all we talked about was monopoly, but it takes four houses to build a hotel. Now, no one wants just four houses, do they? Everyone wants a hotel. Why do you want the hotel? Because it's going to cost the most when someone lands on it and you'll make lots of money. But, but it's like the completion. And, you know, if you've broken the rules, sometimes you end up with two hotels on one property, which is illegal, but <laughs> if you're trying to destroy your siblings in a game of Monopoly, then that's what you try and do. <laughs> what if I said this? When Jesus was talking about building, he was talking about five different areas of your life. Four houses and a hotel. What if one of those houses was your spiritual well-being? And you'll say, oh, no, 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 that should have been the hotel. Well, maybe it's not. What if one of the houses is your spiritual well-being? Another is your physical well-being. Another is your relational well-being. Another is your financial well-being. Another, and the one I'm calling the hotel today, is your emotional well-being. And some of you will disagree with what I'm saying, and that's okay, I don't mind, you can disagree. It doesn't make you right and me wrong, or me right and you wrong. It's not, he, 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 the reason I've, I've left the hotel at the end as our emotional well-being, I'll get to the point. But the first is this, your, emotion, your spiritual well-being. My question to you is, what are you building your spiritual life on? Can I, without offending anyone, hopefully, and I know it's Pentecost Sunday, can I suggest that our spiritual lives ought not to be built on whims, moving worship songs, a moment of inspiration. Our spiritual lives ought not to be something that is based on a fresh wind that blows through. And now I know we talk about the Holy Spirit being a fresh one, no problem with that. But if your spiritual life is built on your emotions in worship, then you've got a problem. Yep. Our spiritual life needs to be built on the Word. The Bible, our regular reading of the Bible, our understanding of what Jesus had to say and how we're to conduct ourselves and how we're to live. Our spiritual lives need to be built on, on prayer and repentance, on confession. Our spiritual well-being needs to be uh, built on the fact of what Jesus says we are rather than what we feel we are. Now, I love moments in worship where it, it, it's like Jesus is almost tangible. It's a fantastic feeling, but it comes and it goes. And if all I ever do is hunt for that sort of feeling, then I'm not on the right track. The reality is I need to know that I am spiritually well in the good times and the bad times. When I feel good and when I don't feel good. When I'm um, healthy and when I'm sick. When, when, when everything's going well for me and when things are not going well. It is well with my soul. Remember that old hymn. That's, that's what we need to build our spiritual well-being on. Our spiritual well-being ought not to be something that gets blown by the wind backwards and forwards. It's not a, it's not a whim. It's not a fancy. It's not, a, it's not an inspirational moment. Now, I'm not suggesting that those inspirational moments can't help build, but that's not the core. Well, that's not the foundation. The foundation is crystal clear. It's here. What gets said publicly should be tested by this. This is the rock. Jesus is the rock. He's the one that we need to build on. And the first house you need to build in your life is your spiritual house. Now, you are partly responsible for it. The, the great pleasure we have is working with the Holy Spirit who not only walks alongside us, but lives within us. He's to teach us and to guide us. He's to build us up. He's to prompt us. He's to trans help us go through the process of transformation the, the house you need to buy if you're on a monopoly board the first house you need to buy is the spiritual house 
and it doesn't cost you. Like I said before, you know, Jesus is our saviour. It's a free gift. And we could go through chapter and verse after chapter and verse about the truth of that. The second house is our relational life. And I don't know about you, but so many people get damaged in their relational life by their experiences with other people. Now, we could go through a long list of other people because there are so many other people around us. It can be family, it can be friends, it can be Christians, it can be churches. There are so many ways that your relational life can become tumultuous. But again, what we need to do is build our relational life on the principles that Jesus espoused. One of the profound things that Jesus did as he walked on the earth was he taught us how to relate to one another, how to treat one another, how we ought to forgive one another. And the, the, the great thing is, if we base our relational life on what Jesus had to say, th then we're going to be in a great place. Now, does that mean we're not going to get hurt? Not at all. Does that mean everything will be perfect? Not at all. But the rock that we build on needs to be the basis for what Jesus said we ought to do. And one of the things he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. In other words, despite the challenges, despite the difficulties, despite the misunderstanding that occurs, love is going to win overall in this. But not the flaky love that the world espouses, but the solid agape love that Jesus espouses. The love that says, you know, if, if Jordan, I keep picking on Jordan, if Jordan hurts me, I'm going to love him anyway. He may mean it, he may not mean it, but it's not going to be a barrier. Why? Because I'll forgive him whether he deserves it or not is irrelevant. I'll forgive him and I'll love him nonetheless. Why? Because Jesus told me that's the way I should build my relational life. That's how I should conduct myself with others. I'm a pastor of a church, been a pastor of a church for a long, long, long time now, well over 30 years. And, and, you know, I don't know if you know this, but some people come to church and they're nice and some people come to church and they're nasty. Now, I know you're all nice people. Is that right? <laughs> and, and, you know, as a pastor of a church, I'm not perfect and I'm the first to put my hand up and say that. But let me say this. Some of the people I've had to work with through the years are not nice people either. And they're not perfect either. But my job, my job, my responsibility is to do what Jesus said. Amen. Love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. I love my neighbour as myself. Or John 13, 35, as I said before. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. Because I'm a Christian, not because I'm the pastor of a church, because I'm a Christian, I ought to consistently love those around about me, no matter what happens. Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, if someone tithes regularly, love them. <laughs> If they buy you a present on your birthday, love them. If they're nice to you and say that you preach well even when you don't, love them. Jesus didn't say any of those things. He said just love them. And that means unconditionally. And we've got time today to talk about unconditional love or agape love. But let me tell you this. That's the standard we're aiming for. That's the standard that has been set for us. And, and that's the one we want to practice. So if you, when it comes to your relational life, now, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I know people go through terrible heartache in their relationships. And I'm not in any way demeaning that. Um, and some of those things need to be worked out through a long and complex process. And uh, I recognize that. But at the core of who we are is what Jesus said about how we're to conduct ourselves in our relational life. And what we need to do is operate out of that. The third one is our financial life. And we know that Jesus taught stewardship. He taught giving. He taught generosity. He taught wisdom. And he taught us to be frugal. He taught us that there's no value difference between the rich person and the poor person. But can I say this? So many people live in a world of pain when it comes to their finances. And I'm talking to you today about getting rich. I'm talking to you about being good stewards based on what Jesus said. There's a house that needs to be built. There's, a, there's a, a spiritual house that needs to be built. There's a 
um, a relational house that needs to be built. There's a financial house that needs to be built. And the way we think about these things makes a significant difference. Do you, do you know what? Envy's not a problem until you see somebody with something more. Do you know, when I went to the caravan show, I liked one caravan, and when I seen a better one, I, I liked that better. It costs more. And to, to, to the car, I'm happy with the car I drive till I see a better one. I'm happy with the house I live in till I see a better one. And, and the core of the problem is my financial thinking. It's, 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 about, it's about lust. It's about envy. I mean, we haven't got time today to look at some of the problems, but, you, you know, if, if we build our financial understanding and well-being on what Jesus said, then we can find freedom from the temptation of many of those other things. I love Paul's approach. You know, he found a way to be content, whatever the situation. Yeah. And, and, you know, when your financial um, well-being is built on the words of Jesus, then you can say the same as Paul. It's not about what you have or you don't have. It's about finding contentedness. And we need contentedness in our spiritual well, uh, spiritual life. We need it in our uh, in, in relational life. We need it in our financial life as well. And it's not about who has this and who doesn't have that. It's got nothing to do with that. It's about appreciating the world that we're living in through the eyes of Jesus who has taught us how we ought to conduct ourselves. What are you building your physical life on? We're all different, but there are some basic principles that apply here. Too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Do you know if I ate only what I really like, that would be a bad thing for me. Because what I like is not good for me. Number one, licorice. <laughs> now you might think, oh, there's nothing wrong with licorice. You're right, there's nothing wrong with licorice. But can I ask you to practice something today? Go home, buy three bags of licorice and eat them all at once and see what happens. <laughs> Your physical life may struggle for a little while there. <laughs> Do you, do you know, we mostly get what we plan to get in our physical life, right? Um, there are older people in our church, some who walk regularly and some who don't. No difference in their physical well-being. In other words, the ones that walk regularly can walk regularly. The ones that don't can too if they chose to. But they've never got into a habit or a practice of it. And isn't it interesting that the ones who regularly walked can still regularly walk and the ones that didn't regularly walk are finding it more and more difficult to stay mobile as they're getting older and older. It's their choice. And can I say, you know, when it comes to our physical life, we need to address it. Why? Because your physical life will affect your financial life, it will affect your relational life. It'll actually, whether you like it or not, it affects your emotional life and your spiritual life. And these are houses that we're building. And, and, and you know, I, what I'm saying is just common sense. But it's an area, again, that we need to consider. And Jesus said a whole lot about it. The final one I want to focus on just for a few more minutes is this. What are you building your emotional life on? Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 1 and 7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. The reason I said it so slowly isn't because I think you're hard of hearing. <laughs> Some of you might be, and that's a physical thing you need to work on. <laughs> it's actually, sometimes I think I'm hard of hearing as well, especially when Ruth's telling me to do something, but <laughs> that's something I'm not so much working on. But anyway, that's another story, which is affecting my relational life. And anyway. <laughs> but God has not given us, given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, I want to be careful with what I say here because... I know people suffer all sorts of emotional health issues. And, you know, I wish that I could just click my fingers and solve them. You know and I know that we can't do that. 
but our emotional health actually impacts on every other area of our life. And sometimes what we're trying to do is fix, fix an emotional health issue that won't ever be fixed until we've addressed some other area of our life first. Because our concern for our financial well-being affects our emotional well-being. You, you, if, you, if, if you can't pay the bills, that's going to affect how you're feeling. If you've got a strained relationship with someone, it's going to affect your emotions. If, if you think that somehow spiritually that <clears throat> because you didn't read your Bible yesterday that God no longer loves you, then that's going to affect your emotions. If you're physically not well, let me tell you, it affects your emotions. You guys would have heard of that, that terrible disease called uh, man flu. Has that, that affected this city in any way? I mean, it's from what I understand, you know, it's, it's a, an insidious curse. It's like when a man gets a cough and he thinks he's going to die. It's, it, it's a terrible thing, you know, and he needs his wife in particular to look after him and to cook all the meals. And it's a terrible thing. I don't know about you, but, you know, when I'm sick, it's, it's often very, very serious. And, uh, <laughs> But, but it's true, though, when you are seriously ill, it affects other, your thinking in so many other areas. Um, and mostly it affects your emotional life. You know, I, I wasn't here, I think it was December. W was it December when Ruth came? Yeah. I wasn't here. Some of you can probably see I've got, I've got now part of my shoulder on my face. I, got a, I had um, a melanoma on my face. Didn't know. It was a minute dot. And as it turned out, I go for a regular skin check. And I said to the guy, I said, listen, there's a, I thought it was, it was the size of two whiskers um, together. That's, a, that's as big as it was. I said to the, said to the guy, what's this on my face? Is it a, is it a blackhead or is it an ingrown hair? Well, you know, because when I shave, I would see it. He said, I don't think it's anything. He said, come back in three months, I have another look, see if it's changed. Went back in three months, it hadn't changed. And he said, I don't think it's anything. But I'm going to do a, a shave biopsy just to check. He did a shave biopsy, which is just like a razor, really. It takes the top off it, and it, it had gone, because it was a minute dot. And, um, and so he sent it away. Turns out it was a melanoma. He contacted me, and he said, listen, we're going to we're have to do some surgery to remove it further. And he said, but don't worry. It's, 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 it's nothing. It's so small. It's, it, we've got it right at the start. So they did the first surgery and took a 50-cent size piece out of my face and um, completely so about four or five mil thick cut it out pulled the whole thing out cut down here on my collarbone and um, cut a piece out and put it back in no whiskers there anymore <coughs> and that was okay well it wasn't really okay let me tell you but anyway um, a week later I went back to the hospital for them to check it and they said yeah no it's healing well uh, but unfortunately we did the analysis of the section we removed and the whole thing was actually a melanoma. Wow. And so, you know, that what, what, what was a minute dot below the surface was about the size of a 50 cent piece. And then I had to go through the whole process again. And, um, and so they, they've cut it in, it's, not so, it's healing up okay. And then they had to cut the whole thing out again. And, um, and they said, listen, had you not told us when you did, another six months and that probably would have been your life, you know. Um, because wow. of the seriousness of it. Now, for me, it's a physical thing, but it affects your emotions. Right? I, I mean, I couldn't come here because I had this great big thing, but it was covered up till mid-January. And, you know, um, if I showed you a picture, it, was, it, was, it wasn't pretty. I mean, the bandage looked good, and I was appreciative of the masks that we all had to wear because most people couldn't see what was going on. <laughs> But, but, you know, what happened where they did it, it all, it, it turns black. And it was like this great big thing. And I'm thinking, how, this is, this is terrible, you know. And I would show Ruth and she, oh, it looks really good. And I'm thinking, you're a liar. <laughs> you're just trying to make me feel better. I right? know it doesn't look good. A friend of mine, I was talking to him via Zoom, and he's like, he's one of those guys who's really particular about the way that he looks. And he goes, well, man, when I get a pimple, I feel bad. And he's in his 60s. He said, how much do you feel? <laughs> Another great word of encouragement for me. Now, I'm saying all of that to say this. Listen, our emotional 
well-being is impacted by, I think, just about everything else that goes on in life. And yet the Bible speaks about the fact that we're to experience joy. We don't experience joy because everything's perfect. Joy is the portion that we receive as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit. But too often, if we go back to the passage I just read from Timothy, it says we've been given a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. And, you know, I really wonder at times whether any of those three are true in our lives. There are times where we, we don't think we have power. There are times when love seems absent and our sound mind gets clouded out by all of the the things that run through our thinking. We think about what people think about. We assume they're saying things. We assume they're acting in a certain way. There is so much that goes on. Can I encourage you today? What Jesus taught us, in particular in the Gospels, was for our benefit so that we could build on a house, uh, build like a house that's situated on a rock. But you've got to attend to the areas that he spoke about. And he covers all five of those areas in his teaching in various forms or manners. In Galatians chapter 5. It's over the page here. Verse 22 and verse 23. Passages I'm sure you've heard. But let me say it and I'll read it slow to you again. It says this. And we know it's Pentecost Sunday. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there is no law against these things. Your emotional well-being, your spiritual well-being, your financial, your physical, and your relational well-being, can and should be impacted by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and the outcome you should experience. Forget about everyone else for a moment. Because, you know, for you to have a testimony, something good has got to happen inside your life. Something good has got to be coming out of your life for someone else to experience it. And and what we read about here in Galatians is that the sort of fruit that we will feel a love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the experience we can have, and when that's true in our lives, others will see it. Others will be able to testify of the transformation that you've experienced in your life because of the work of the Holy Spirit. This year, your focus is building. Can I implore you to build in the way that Jesus encouraged you to build? I started by reading from Luke chapter 6, and I want to finish by reading the same same passage of Scripture. So if the musos would like to come, that'd be great. Luke 6, 46 to 49 says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me, And hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. Then he says, they are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But verse 49 says this, but the one who hears my words... It does not put them into practice. It's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Today, I don't know what your situation is, but I do know this. The application of Jesus' words in your life will make a significant difference. It's, it's, It's not a miracle cure. It's a long and slow process. No foundation is built in a moment. It takes time. But as you build the foundation of your well-being, in those five different areas, what you can do is you can build a hotel on the top. And that hotel on the top will include all five different areas, which will be pleasurable to you and pleasurable to everybody else. 
You'll experience the joy that Jesus meant for you to experience. You, you'll experience the peace that Jesus meant for you to experience. The only difference is those who practice what he uh, and put into practice what he said and those that don't. First of all, a confession. I don't know that I put into practice everything Jesus says yet either. There are areas in my life where I'm still learning obedience. Where I still haven't put into practice the things that he said, where I haven't addressed what he's spoken to me about. And I'm going to keep working on it. But there are benefits that come from obedience in other areas. It's not like we choose the areas we're obedient in and the ones that we're not. It's just that in the course of our life, the Holy Spirit addresses different things at different times for a different reason, different purpose at any particular stage. Will you stand together with me this morning? I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And you know, I could pray for people today, but the answer is not my prayer. And you might say, well, oh, come on, but you can pray for him. No, you don't need me to pray. It's in practicing what he said. So where you need to forgive, forgive. Where you need to change or take control of your thinking with regard to your emotions, take control. When you're in an argument, don't say what you don't mean. When you say, Lord, really mean what you're saying. Father, today, I thank you for your word. And I keep learning from your word every single day as I read your word, as, as the Holy Spirit convicts me of sin at times. I thank you for the way that you speak to me, for the way that you nurture me, for the way that you're teaching me, for the way that you're training me. Yet despite all your glorious input, I know there are many times where I don't put into practice the things that you challenge me to put into practice. And I know that I, knew, I still need to learn, I still need to grow. I still need to repent and ask forgiveness. I still need to confess. And so I pray today for everyone who's in earshot of this communication, whether here in the room or online, that, Father, you would give us what we need, that you would allow us to exercise self-control so that we can actually put into practice things that Jesus said we ought to put into practice. And so, Father, today in our relational life, if we need to forgive someone, help us to forgive. If we need to take control of our finances or our physical well-being, help us to take control there. In our spiritual disciplines, Father, let us attend to them so that we can continue to grow closer to you. And I pray for our emotional well-being as well. Lord, that our minds would be clean and clear and that we'd be able to do what we want to do without the harassing voice that tries to bring us down. Father, I pray today for everyone in this room, just watch over them and bless them. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.